So this is the energy equity gap and dealing hidden energy poverty. So as we have been moving through uh, towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 7 of ensuring electricity access for all, we have realized that there are many dimensions to electricity access. There's affordability, meaning can you afford it given that you have the supply? Reliability, that's what we think of when we think of the Texas disaster or the New Orleans disaster with just not having any supply of electricity and not knowing when it will come back. The quantity is how many appliances can you connect when you actually have that electricity connection. Quality is once you connect those appliances, are they going to overheat and burn out? Uh, so if your phone has ever gotten too hot when you had it on the charger, that means that the quality of electricity was not correct for that battery. And then the supply of electricity focuses on what people generally think of when they think of electricity access of are there enough power plants in a region to cover all of the electricity demand. My work focuses on decision analysis and using that to inform sustainable transitions. And the key thing here is trade-offs because no transition is going to be perfect. So we have one corner of this triangle being development and transition, specifically what we think of when we think of uh, technology, innovation, technology deployment, uh, our research and development of new technologies. Then there's environmental sustainability, meaning you know, what are the air pollution emissions looking like, land use, water use, and how is that going to um, kind of be impacted at a national scale? And at the top of this pyramid is equality. So not only is it about the total level of air pollution emissions reductions, but also the distribution of those emissions and the distribution of those costs. Now equality, I should acknowledge that it is multi-dimensional, meaning uh, that it can vary across temporal scales and spatial scales. So if we are thinking about the spatial scales, actually, I'll talk about that next. I'll talk about temporal first. So temporal scales can be historical injustices that we want to correct for, as well as modern day injustices. But then we also have the challenge of thinking through what might the future injustices be from new technology deployment. And so for the spatial scales, there's the macro scale where that's going to deal with global level extraction of materials and also global waste streams. Then there's the meso scale, which are national scale issues. This can be unequal access to renewable energy technologies, air pollution effects, as I mentioned before, job distribution, and also changes in electricity prices. And then the last is the micro scale, and that's going to be local environmental impacts. And this could also be exclusion of rural areas from benefits. And another one is um, the ability to cool or heat your home. So, one of the things that we're gonna do now is gonna have an interactive portion. And if Alyssa or Ali could post that link in the chat that I sent you guys, that'd be great. And I wanna know, what do you guys think of when you hear the term energy poverty? And so when you go to that interactive portion, you should come to this Google Slides event. Hopefully I will start seeing these people pop up here. And then we're gonna to go to slide two, which is what is the biggest challenge for energy or electricity poverty? Awesome, I'm seeing all the anonymous animals pop up on the screen. <laughs> and let's see, you guys should be able to move these X's. Hey, anonymous, uh, what's it called? Yeah, I can see y'all moving forward. Hey, well, not supposed to do that, walrus. And squirrel, walrus, come back from slide seven. There we go, we're on slide two. So don't move ahead or else it ruins all the surprises, you know? Okay, so you guys should be able to move these X's, hopefully. I see somebody has highlighted one. Oh yeah, so we have no access to electricity. This is typically developing countries. We have non-inclusive decision-making, inability to afford electricity, places with a lot of power outages, uh, needing better technology development and government programs, or people's inability to keep a comfortable indoor temperature. I see people are correcting my English. <laughs> Sorry for the typos. <laughs> Somebody really cares a lot about this. And my they just bad. get one X, right, Destiny? They just get one X per person? Yeah, just one X. Okay. okay, so I'm seeing a ton of people in these top quadrants, right? Um, although now that I said that, <laughs> some people are like, oh, no, I need my voice to be heard, right? 
And so now I see some people more coming in these two bottom quadrants, but it looks like the no access to electricity in developing countries is the biggest one, followed by non-inclusive decision making, um, which actually could feed into the government programs, right? So thinking about who gets to qualify for those programs, how are those programs distributed? Um, that's a big one. Places with a lot of power outages. So the people that kind of pick this one are probably more concerned with reliability concerns. Um, and then inability to afford electricity. That's what we actually think of as traditional energy poverty in, in the United States. And then people's inability to keep a comfortable indoor temperature is the last, um, but certainly not least. And that may actually have come about because of the pandemic. So, okay, now we're going back to the slides. So energy poverty in the US, as I said, the most common way to measure it is energy burden, which looks at what percent of your income do you spend meeting your energy needs. So the darkest part of this figure is showing people that spend more than 19% of their income satisfying their energy bills, where the lightest part of this uh, map is showing people who spend less than 6% of their income meeting their energy bills, and this is by census track. And so really energy burden or that cost is that core part of energy poverty. And if we go one level out, energy insecurity is about the reliability and outage risk concerns as well as costs. And then I would say the total, to, total to, uh, totality of energy poverty is thinking about supply concerns plus insecurity plus energy burden. And so that's actually, you know, my interactive part was really a trick question because they're all so related. And oftentimes people try to look at these things as if they're separate and distinct, but really they're all encompassing because if you don't have supply in an area, then it's, you can't measure reliability, you can't measure the cost of that supply. And so they're not independent of each other. So oops, how we currently measure energy poverty, um, I'm actually going to kind of speed through this one just for time since I spent a lot of time talking about my path. But we think a lot about it in terms of primary versus secondary metrics and relative versus absolute metrics. And all of these are currently missing people's consumption and behavior. So for example, if we just think about, you know, the traditional energy poverty metric of how much are you spending on meeting your energy bills, this doesn't capture who is not spending money on or forgoing energy, for example. So I'm missing that behavior of you actually trying to save money and maybe if you can spend it on something else. So my question is, do you actually, do you ever, have you ever felt like you have adapted your behavior to reduce financial strain? So if we go back to the Google slides, that would be slide three. So yes or no, if in the winter, have you ever kept your house colder than you would have liked to save money? And if so, how often? So you should drag next to the yes or the no section. And then for only the yes people, you do it all the time, some of the time, or rarely. And Allie, while people are doing that, can you remind me what time I'm supposed to stop at? So around um, 1130, just so we have our okay. 1135. So we have a few minutes, so 10, 15 minutes for questions. That sounds good. Okay, <laughs> so we have a resounding yes, right? Meaning, and just a few no's. So to all the no's out there, we are so happy for you and we are so envious, right? Um, so for those yeses, most people are in that sometimes all the time. And so one of the things that we are, that I hope that you take away from this presentation is depending on how much you are doing this and the degree to which you're limiting your energy consumption in order to save money, you actually may have been experiencing a hidden form of energy poverty and you yourself may have been energy poor and could have used some energy assistance. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint. So for those, just because we had some in the no category, I'm gonna go through this, right? That way we can all be on the same page. So let's consider two households. Household one has an income of $30,000 and they spend 5% of their disposable income on meeting their energy needs. And so under the traditional energy poverty metric of just looking at, do you spend more or less than 10%, these people would be considered not energy poor. Then household two has an income of $100,000. They also spend 5% meeting their energy needs, but they're also not poor and energy poor. And so this really misses human behavior and people's tendency to reduce their consumption to save money. 
So our goal here was to integrate people's behavior into energy poverty analysis and actually quantify the energy limiting behavior under different household types, thus unveiling a hidden form of energy poverty. So our proposed metric is called the energy equity gap. It's at the population and household level. We're saying that this is going to be a primary relative metric, primary meaning that we're using data directly from the households. We're gonna be looking at people's actual energy consumption. And it's a mix between a relative and an absolute metric because it's not just about, do you get over a threshold, but how close or far away are you from that energy poverty threshold? To give you some background, our study region is Arizona in the United States, and it's in this red box right here in the south of the US. Just to make sure we're all on the same page about the climate, it's extremely hot summers, mild winters, and those summers are very long. And so for this work, we are going to be focused on air conditioning usage because that is um, what people are using for a long portion of time. And we are concerned about heat waves. That is a social justice and energy justice issue because especially during the pandemic, if you are not able to keep a cool temperature inside of your home during a heat wave, you could experience heat exhaustion or heat stroke. And that is a really big concern for the area. So our research process here is we first start by gathering household level utility data by working with the utility company. We then match this to a household level demographic survey. This is gonna give us information on people's income status, their demographic group, or their ethnicity and their race, as well as their household age and some other information. We are also gathering local temperature data. This is gonna let us know how hot it is outside. Then we calculate the household inflection temperature, which I'll explain to you on the next slide and we calculate our energy equity gap um, for that year. The household inflection temperature, we are defining it as the temperature at which a household shifts from heating to cooling. So here is a graph for one household in one year of our study. Each, uh, on the x-axis, we have the daily mean outdoor temperature. On the y-axis, we have the daily electricity consumption in kilowatt hours. And each blue dot represents one day of the year in terms of their electricity consumption. The black line is our regression. So once the regression is run, we will get this. And the star represents the inflection temperature, meaning that at this point, we would start to see people being willing to turn on their air conditioning unit for the year. So here we see the inflection temperature for this one household is 69 degrees Fahrenheit. And I should acknowledge that we have 6,000 of these households in our study. And our hypothesis here is that lower income households are going to have higher inflection temperatures because they are enduring hotter temperatures in order to save money on meeting those energy bills. And this is our regression analysis. So it is a <clears throat> polynomial regression and we include variables like the daily temperature, out, that's the outdoor temperature again. We include the electricity price because different customers will have different time of use price plans whether it's a weekend or a holiday. And then we also include day of the week fixed effects and month of the year fixed effects to account for seasonal and weekly variability. So our energy equity gap is um, what I'm gonna talk to you about on this slide. On the Y axis, we have the inflection temperature in Fahrenheit. And on the X axis, we have the different income groups where one is the lowest income group and eight is the highest income group. And this is for the first year of our study, which is 2015 to 2016. And the energy equity gap is defined as the maximum inflection temperature subtracted from the minimum inflection temperature, or the, sorry, the minimum median inflection temperature. And so here we see in our lowest income group, it's 68.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And in our highest income group, we have 62.9 degrees Fahrenheit. So the difference between these two groups is about six degrees Fahrenheit in terms of outdoor temperature when the groups would turn on their air conditioning units. So, um, and one thing I do want to remind you is that these are average outdoor temperatures, so the mean. And so it actually can be getting a lot hotter than this outside because again, you know, when you're including those nighttime temperatures, it will, like the average for the day will appear to be lower. So we are concerned with progress over the city. So how the city, uh, how the metropolitan area is changing and whether or not people are becoming more or less, you know, more or less equal in terms of their ability to cool their houses when it starts to get hot outside. And so here we have the different, the four years of our study on the x-axis and the inflection temperatures on the y-axis. 
The different colors represent different income groups where the pink at the bottom is the highest income group, that's group eight, and the gray at the top is the lowest income group, which is group one. Well, those are people that make less than $15,000 a year. And we have here at the top, the energy equity gap, which is just showing you the difference between the, high, uh, the highest part of the graph and the lowest part. So we see that it starts off at six degree difference and all of a sudden it decreases to 4.7 and then the gap starts to widen again and gets all the way up to 7.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, one of the things that's really interesting in this graph is that there's little overlap between these income groups. There's a very clear distinction in waiting longer and longer to turn on that, the air conditioning unit. A second thing that we notice is that over time, the high income group is, seems to be decreasing that inflection temperature, meaning they are, turn, they are turning on their air conditioning units earlier um, and earlier in the, in the summer. And one thing that, that we might take away from that is there may be a higher level of ability to adapt to climate change as weather patterns are going to change. And also in this top part, we see that all of a sudden there's a huge decrease and then they start to increase over time. And this might be caused by inability to adapt because of changing electricity prices, right? And so we also have to dig deeper into, you know, what is causing this lowest income group to actually you know, dip down in terms of the inflection temperatures and then start to actually get back up almost to where they started. So one thing that people have asked is, well, what if these are just preferences between different groups? There are you know, racial differences here. There's gonna be age differences here. And so we have pulled out different, um, different ethnicities and looked at the, energy, uh, the inflection temperature. So on the y-axis we have the inflection temperature in Fahrenheit and then on the x-axis again we have the different years and now each different color represents a different racial demographic and we see that the black population that dotted black line is at the very top of the inflection temperatures and then the white population actually follows the base case that is the largest group in our sample the Hispanic group is this green dotted line and the Asian group is the yellow one and we do see that there is some mixing of inflection temperatures here. So it's not necessarily for certain that there is one preference for you know, a, a distinct preference between all these groups. And so you can't just say that it's just ethnicities that are driving the differences here. And then if we look at the, in, uh, the energy equity gap, so if you looked at the highest and lowest uh, incomes within each of these groups, what's gonna happen? And so we see, here, so this is the energy equity gap by ethnicity on the y-axis. And if the energy equity gap is very low, that means that everybody in the group, regardless of income, is consuming, is starting to use their air conditioning unit at the same, uh, at the same outdoor temperature. And if it's very high, that means that there is a large disparity between income groups within one ethnicity. So we see in the Asian population, it starts off there, you know, relatively equal at five degrees, but then all of a sudden it's widening up until nine degrees. And so that um, highlights an increasing disparity between income groups within the Asian population. With the black population, we see that people started to get equally worse off. And then the gap kind of rose almost to its same exact level at, it started off at about 5.7, and now it's a little bit above six. And so then the big question here is, you know, what's happening within these groups? And again, you know, so what about preferences within those different racial groups, right? And preferences are a big concern here because this is all about behavior. So if we look at the demographics, so now we're going to focus a little bit on racial inequality and energy use. And we're looking here at the demographics across income groups. So again, one is the lowest income group, eight is the highest income group. And this is just showing you the distribution of the racial groups across our study, where green, the green is the black population, the blue is the Hispanic population, yellow is the Asian population, and the gray is the white or Caucasian population. So if we look just at the black population, and so here we're, we're trying to you know, disaggregate preferences versus inequality, we would actually assume that if it was a preference for the entire group, that it would be a very narrow vertical distribution that everybody would be consuming at the same level. But what we see here, just looking at the black population first, 
is it's a very wide vertical distribution, especially between that highest income group and the second lowest income group. And so this actually represents an inequality. Now, one of the interesting things here is that this gray line, which is the lowest income group, is actually in the middle of all of these. And one thing that we did not have in our uh, demographic survey is whether or not these people are participating in energy assistance programs. And so that is something that needs to be done for further analysis to actually see, you know, once people take up those energy assistance programs, are they actually able to start consuming more energy at their desired temperature? Now, you know, we, we can't get that information due to privacy concerns, right? That's one limitation of our analysis, but that is our hypothesis about why this gray bar seems to be in the middle, because in order to qualify for those, um, like weatherization programs, the low income housing energy assistance program, you do have to be at like, you know, the federal standard of poverty, which is economic based. Then for the Hispanic population, one of the things we notice is that everyone except for those people in the lowest income group have a very tight vertical distribution. And so we would assume that within the population, this would most likely be a preference, right? For an inflection temperature between uh, 61 to 66 degrees, but then this lowest income group is experiencing some form of inequality because they're very far outside that preference. And so here we're just showing you, um, we have done this for the four main groups. Now we see that the, out of all of the groups, the black population has the highest uh, vertical distribution meaning that this would need to be something that we would investigate further in terms of why are we seeing so much inequality and such a large vertical spread within this group. And um, we do see some wonky things here like this, you know, this group level five, so 50 to 75,000 in the Asian population all of a sudden decreasing over time. Now that is something that we are investigating further, but in general, we do see that the lowest Income groups are always at the highest inflection temperature, regardless of the racial makeup uh, or the racial ethnicity of that group, and that the highest income groups tend to fall to the bottom. And there's no discernible differences. So what we have concluded from this is that there's no discernible differences in temperature preferences across ethnicities. And as statistically, ethnicity is not a good indicator of the different inflection temperatures. Now, another thing that we have been investigating is ages, right? Because there could actually be an age preference um, across different groups. And so here, um, this distribution is just showing you the age groups here, where at the bottom, we have 75 year olds, then we have 65 to 74, and it goes all the way down to 18 to 24 year olds. So here, I just pulled out two. Um, so we have 25 to 34 year olds and 75 plus. And we see that there's not really a clear distinction between the different income groups in either case. And that each of them seems to have a relatively narrow distribution. The, 24 to th the 25 to 34 year olds is a bit wider and the 75 year olds, at least in 2015 are extremely narrow. It kind of widens a little bit and then it goes narrow again. And so we are seeing, we are uh, observing a potential preference in this group for a higher temperature. And so there's nothing that we can explicitly conclude from the age um, dis distribution. And so we can't actually say that different ages as a whole will just have different preferences in terms of when they turn on their air conditioning units. So on, for some of our ongoing work, we are still asking this question of, you know, what has caused that energy equity gap to shrink and then widen? And some of the things that we have been considering are maximum average monthly temperature, cooling degree days, meaning how much for the different days of the year, how much would you actually need to spend on cooling your home? We have the average residential electricity price. And of course, we're comparing that to our energy equity gap. And one of the things that we have noticed is that an increase in um, an increase in the cooling degree days and the average electricity price, then is followed by an increase in our energy equity gap. And so because we have to use a whole year's worth of data to calculate the energy equity gap, we hypothesize that behavior changes could take a while to catch up to price and temperature shifts, 
um, because again, we have to find that minimum point. And so it would take a whole year in order to see a new inflection temperature. And then the other part of that is, you know, if electricity prices are rising, most of the time people will not be able to adjust their behavior until they actually have gotten their electricity bill. Since most people only get their electricity bill once a month, by the time February is over, it is too late now to change how much electricity they were consuming in February. And now they may think, oh, well, March is warmer, so I'm not going to consume as much. And they're going to keep shifting. But next year, they're going to say, oh, you remember last year, we spent way too much in February. So y'all need to you know, get some blankets, you know, throw on some hoodies and, and all this other stuff. And so then they're going to probably take a while to adjust their behavior over time to account for these electricity price changes. So I started off by talking about the traditional way of measuring energy poverty being the percent of income that people spend meeting their energy bills or covering their energy bills. So using our data, we also have calculated the traditional energy poverty metric, which is that percent of income that people spend. So here on the x-axis, we have the percent that people are spending on meeting their energy bills, where the red line designates the 10% threshold. And then the y-axis is the number of households. And so here, what we see in 2015 to 2016, we have 2.7% of the population who would be defined as energy poor. This uh, lessens in 2016, but then all of a sudden it starts to rise again. And by 2018, we look like we're back exactly where we started, meaning that, okay, we tried, we still had the same amount of energy poor, so now we're back to square one. And we're saying that this threshold measure, since it does not measure the relative amount of poverty, it may not have been um, indicative of how close people are to that threshold. And then, you know, what is causing it? Is it the, you know, people who are able to consume more electricity because the, you know, prices have decreased or if the prices have increased, then is it just people now limiting their behavior? And so then they would actually appear to not be energy poor because they're just not spending any money on meeting those bills, right? They're just not, they're just not having the bill. So for our energy equity gap, and how it might inform policy, we are proposing a tier-based aid system based on our household inflection temperatures, where the low risk zone would be the median inflection temperature of the highest group to two times that energy equity gap above that median. Now we use the highest income group as our baseline here because we are assuming that these would most likely be the households without any budget constraints whatsoever. So they're the people most likely in a region to consume as much electricity as they need to make sure that they are having a comfortable indoor environment. And we want to make sure that this metric is flexible in order to be able to adapt to different climate zones. And so that's why we're proposing to use the highest income group of that climate zone as the baseline measure. And then for the first tier of energy insecurity, we would be looking at two uh, times the energy gap above the median, all the way up to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is because government buildings recommend turning on their cooling systems when it reaches 78 degrees outside in order to minimize the risk of allergens inside, mold, pollen, and other health concerns that could be, you know, um, that could come in inefficient buildings. And so then if you're waiting until it's above an average temperature of 70 degrees outside, meaning, you know, you may even be waiting until it's like 90 degrees or something to turn on that air conditioning unit, we would say that you're in our second tier and that would be our energy poverty tier. So my question for all of you is how many people do you believe overlaps between the energy, the two energy poverty metrics that we've talked about thus far? So if we're going here um, and here we have 4,500 households, how many people do you believe overlap between our tier two and the traditional energy poverty metric? So I just wanted to let you know that there are um, 141 defined as energy poor under the the traditional energy poverty metric, and 86 were defined as energy poor under our tier two. Okay, so let's see. Yeah. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, we got a really wide spread. <laughs> Um, okay, the group has no consensus. Oops, people keep moving my sticks. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, so it seems like the majority of people are saying of at least 25, right? I think we can probably agree on that, that at least 25 people we would guess have overlapped between our two metrics. Dun, 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 dun. Bum, 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 bum. Here we go. Only three. What? That's crazy. So we had all the households in our study and our in our low risk zone. That's where actually we see the highest overlap with this traditional energy poverty greater of the traditional energy poverty metric where you look at if people are spending more than 10% of their income. That's where we would see our low risk zone. Because again, you have to remember, these are people who are limiting energy, so they're not spending the money on energy. And then in our first tier, we see some overlap, but with our second tier, only three out of 4,577 households are classified under both the second tier and um, this traditional energy poverty metric. So one of the things we learned here is energy poverty is hidden. Come on, guys, you said it at the very beginning, right? You didn't think that you were energy poor, but you had limited a lot of your behavior. And so you guys are not going to show up in those traditional ways of calculating energy poverty by only looking at the amount that you're spending on meeting your energy needs. Um, by only focusing on what people spend, I mean, that's like saying, are you, are you food poor based on how much you spend at the grocery store, right? So if you only spend $2 at the grocery store because you're buying pasta and sauce, <laughs> right? Versus somebody who's spending um, like, I don't know, 20 bucks because they got salmon and, and cod or something, something fancy, right? Now you guys know what I, now you guys know my bar for fanciness. Um, then we are not actually asking you like, are you consuming all of the calories and nutrition that you need, right? And so you're actually limiting your nutritional value of the food because you can, you feel like you can only afford pasta and sauce, but anybody that just looked at the percent of your income that you spent would define you as not food poor because you're spending a low amount of your money. And same thing for energy poverty, right? If you're not spending money and you're still only spending 10% of your income or 5% of your income on meeting your energy needs, but you're super cold in your house and you feel like you can't think straight because you're so cold or in the summer, it's so hot in your house and you know, being in there is giving you a headache and you feel like you're sick and you got to go to the doctor. Like that's also not what we want in terms of energy and households, especially during the pandemic when people were stuck at home during all those stay at home measures. So for some policy implications of this, um, the key here is needing to identify households that are experiencing more than one type of poverty because effective policy targets um, are going to really focus on meeting you know, the multiple dimensions of energy poverty. And so we need to also think about you know, who needs weatherization because a lot of times when you are not able to consume your energy needs, that might mean that your insulate that your home is not properly insulated, meaning you're losing a lot of like a lot of energy due to like heat loss um, in the winter or you know cooling loss in the summer from just energy seeping out or that um, yeah the, the outdoor temperature seeping in through your walls. And we are advocating for a mix of financial and weatherization assistance depending on need, right? So here, if we have our inflection temperatures on the y-axis versus the household income. If you have a very high inflection temperature and a low income, we would say that you're in that primary policy target. Those are who we really want to target uh, in terms of like the low income groups that also are not able to start using their ACs until a very high outdoor temperature. Then um, a low income group with a low inflection temperature, we would think of that as like a secondary policy target. So that may be like, you know, the traditional ways of energy assistance where we're just making sure that you have the amount that you need to spend on energy. And then we get into those higher income groups. It really depends on, you know, other factors like age, for example. So even an elderly person who, you know, may look like it has like a higher income level, they may need energy assistance if they're not able to, if they have like really high medical bills. And so that's one challenge that we're seeing with only using total income in doing these analyses and not including disposable income, because total income doesn't take into account you know, medical bills, if you have like a life dependence on electricity needs, like, for example, those, um, those oxygen tanks, right, dialysis, I mean, that gets really expensive for people. And even somebody who's making $80,000 a year might only have a disposable income of 20 grand a year, right. Uh, and so that's going to be somebody who is missed 
under using just a total income threshold. So just to wrap it up, the energy equity gap is used is what we're using to capture relative equity among the population in terms of energy equity. And it uses the same information required to calculate the traditional energy poverty metric. So the benefit here is that um, further da data collection is actually not needed as long as you have the daily electricity consumption of a household. And we think that this is really a complementary metric to that traditional one. So we're not proposing to replace the traditional energy poverty metric. We are actually saying that this is a hidden form of energy poverty. And we do think that um, regions should be using both measures because poverty is multidimensional and can be very complex, but also just people experience it very differently. In terms of future work, what we're doing right now is investigating how COVID-19 has impacted people's energy use. And we are working on applying our energy equity analysis to 2019 to 2020 data. And we also are trying to compare with other regions. Um, for example, Delaware and Chicago have higher winter temperatures. And so that is means that we need to think about, you know, how do we get the turn on point for the AC unit and the heating units? Uh, so thank you very much for listening. And I would be happy to take any questions. Oh, I also should let you guys know that our paper is published as a preprint. And this is the um, link where you can get it. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to um, open up the for questions now, and, and it's great. I already see some hands up, so please use the hand raising function. Um, so we'll start with, with Jean, please go ahead. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Nock, for your presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I find your method of um, using the inflection temperature as a uh, measure of the behavior very accurate, and it's also able to be observed empirically, so that's really great. Um, my question is, like, when you control for um, preferences, you looked at age and ethnicity. However, I wonder if there are other preferences that may be valuable to consider. For example, the one that I'm thinking of is whether someone is uh, very environmentally aware, they care about the impacts of electricity use on the environment. Could that be something that could impact um, their decision when they and their behaviors in turning on and off their air conditioning. Wonder if you can speak a little bit about that. Thank you. So preferences are really hard to capture. And actually, when we're when we found all the inflection temperatures, I mean, you do see a lot of variability across all income groups. And preferences are, you know, a factor of what people how people how comfortable people feel. So their body mass index, for example how much they're willing to spend on it, and also how they view, um, so as you said, like their environmental impact on it. So if people were trying to become more energy efficient, they could reduce that, but that's not going to, we would have to do like a specific household analysis to see that. And then most likely you would not see large changes over time. So you wouldn't see as big of swings as we saw here in terms of like that high degree. Now, we have thought a lot about preferences and I mean, I will say that we don't actually control for preferences because preferences are something that we cannot capture. In order to get a preference, we would have to go to every household and ask, okay, you set your thermostat at this, why did you do it? What are the exact reasons of that? Because preferences are um, kind of hidden in that energy usage, right? So I don't know if people just think it's too hot outside. I don't, I don't know if they think that it's, um, that they just can't afford it or, oh, like, you know, I, I just am a big, a big person. I'm from Massachusetts and I just like it cold in my house, right? That's, those are just kind of some of the things that we can't capture from the survey that we did. I think okay. you. Yeah, Brianna, please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Nock, thanks again. Um, I'm Brianna, and uh, you're talking about the behavioral changes and how sometimes they can take a while to catch up because a lot of people only get their their bill once a month. But we hear a lot about um, kind of this real-time monitoring now and people have Nest thermostats, et cetera. And so curious if you had thoughts on how a wider adoption of maybe smart thermostats would change some of these 
um, behavioral patterns or if maybe that would even increase the equity gap because a lot of lower income households may not be able to afford those. Um, however, sometimes there are utility programs that can provide those for free. So just curious what your thoughts are on that. So for the NESA, I do agree that we see a lot of high income households adopting that technology. And it's really more of like a resource problem than, you know, an energy justice problem per se, because it's one, do you have the money, as you mentioned, but two, do you own the house and can you change the infrastructure of your house? And so if you can't change the infrastructure of your house, then you're not going to be able to adopt it at all, right? Because that's your landlord's house. If they're not going to allow you to change, it doesn't matter if it's free or not. Um, and so that's going to be another barrier to adoption for those nest thermostats that we're going to see in lower income groups. So one of the things that I believe we will see if more people adopt this nest is a higher base load because the nest is going to be able to shift from cooling to heating on its own. And it's going to try to keep it at a constant flat temperature. Now you're still going to see this kind of U shape of the curve because of course, as it gets hotter, you're just gonna, your system's gonna have to work harder. And same thing when it gets colder, but now you're gonna start to see it shift on and off that heating and cooling. So you're, you're probably gonna see your base load increase because your AC is never gonna be just on. Whereas if you were consciously thinking about setting your thermostat, then you may turn it off and open those windows, right? And that, that is actually going to be where you're gonna to start to see like this minimum consumption. So at like 10, this is when, you know, all of your baseload appliances, like your fridge, your, you know, water heater and those like your TV and all the other stuff is plugged in, but you're just not using your heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. Now, when we see the nest, I'm pretty sure that most people just don't ever really turn it off, right? Because it's always keeping it at their ideal point. Now, some people will, will um, kind of get annoyed with it <laughs> and then they'll try to override it and, and things like that. And then you also see shifting of the temperature of like when they're cooling your home earlier. But since we look at daily electricity consumption, we wouldn't necessarily be seeing all those little changes. Now that might occur more if you're looking at like an hourly. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, I think um, I'm gonna try to go in order guys, but the next one up is our Delia Clark. You're welcome to unmute and ask your question now if you have one. Yes, I do. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Absolutely. Hi. Doctor, thank you so much, Dr. Nock. I had this was a great presentation. I'm here representing um NRO, listening on your presentation. And I had a quick question. Um, how do you think your energy equity gap holds up for other regions? Like I know you mentioned wanting to do future work for Chicago and other areas that have different temperature. Uh, outside temperatures than your test study of Arizona. So I was just curious how you thought this would hold up in other studies. So one of the, we actually have been looking at Chicago right now and the, the um, high levels of winter users and summer is really challenging at this point because you have to find those two balance points. Um, so you like, instead of having one inflection temperature now I have to find two. And developing a model to do that, we're using a piece for starting to develop a piecewise linear where it would uh, come down and then shoot over for that base load and then go back up again. But as you can see in this one household, the base load goes from you know, 10 kilowatt hours to like 30 kilowatt hours, right? And so then it's actually proving to be difficult to find those two inflection temperatures, one for the winter and one for the summer. So now what we're actually doing is trying to parse out the data. So instead of looking at one year all at the same time, we are going to look at July to February and then um, February to like August. And so that we're gonna try to parse them out separately and actually use those individually to find those turn on points because um, yeah, I think that that is what we think is more robust because here we're kind of mixing the turn on and turn off points of both. Thank you so much. I have follow-ups, so I'll probably email you. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thank you. All right, super team. Thank you, Dr. Nock, Subrajit here. I was, um, yeah, it's very insightful to look into the um, energy equity gap you defined. Um, I think uh, the difference was really um, 
something very uh, interesting. So I was looking at this uh, um, inflection point and I was wondering to the, the houses or the households you're looking at, are you also only looking at households with electrical heating? Or, yes. Uh, so, yeah, so we're only looking at households with electric heating, not natural gas. Yeah, so does that mean that it is, um, is that because you are um, limited on the data you get on natural gas use? Yeah, so the electricity company does not provide us with any natural gas use at all for any of the households. And then two, because this is a polynomial regression, if all of a sudden a half of the curve just disappears, you're not gonna get the correct fit um, because all of a sudden it's gonna you know, have a really sharp decrease and then it's gonna look really flat. And then that messes up the fit of the curve. And so um, for there, we are trying to include our piecewise linear where we would only find a cooling inflection point because they don't have a heating inflection point. Um, and yeah, that's the main reason. Thank you. All right, Tanner, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, what other controls do you think that would be useful or helpful, I guess? I mean, I think of like rental, rental versus ownership of the housing and the housing type. And that might go very long well with Kind of income level like rate of home ownership and like you know housing types versus large apartment blocks versus homes Is there any sort of data that kind of aligns with that or you guys have examined so we have been examining the number of air conditioning units within the house and the household size as our two main um, control variables i think that um, multi-family versus single family that one I mean, we, we'd have to take into account the fact that like, if you live on the top floor, it feels a lot different than if you live on the bottom floor. And that's something that we have not gotten into, but we have found that when controlling for the household size and the number of air conditioning units, we do see, you know, some differences across income groups and within the different household groups. So one thing I will acknowledge here is that I only presented about, you know, when people turn it on. But one thing that we're doing right now is once you turn it on, how much are you willing to use, right? Because that is also a big concern of how flat are those curves? And as we go deeper into climate change and we see more extreme temperatures, are people going to be able to adjust their energy usage um, in order to maintain that comfortable indoor temperature? And one of the things that we are seeing is that even when you control for the number of air conditioning units and the household size, that the lowest income group just has a much flatter curve. And so that's what we're saying is like the infrastructure divide between some of these groups and energy usage. Arhana. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Nock. It was a very informative and insightful presentation. And as I was look, listening to you, uh, I was thinking because this is a massive problem in our country, which is Bangladesh. And I was also thinking that since there are different issues in our country, for example, political issues, for example, a new party when it comes to power, they only lower the price or make electricity accessible for a certain period of time to make things, you know, as a political stunt. And also other factors, like there are many remote areas there they also don't have much access to electricity. So are these the type of factors that you also notice in, you know, in a developed country like the US? Or, yeah, I, I was just curious about that. So I think that that's like a really hard question to answer just because it also depends on who's making decisions and where, like, you know, where, how those decisions translate down into electricity bills within different regions. So even if we were looking in Arizona, there are multiple utility companies and multiple structures. So having like a regulated versus a deregulated market, is there competition in that market? And then of course you do have political agendas that will be uh, determining or pushing for different um, technologies to come onto the grid, like wind and solar. And then there's you know, questions about how that variability will mix into the market and change those prices. Um, and then, of course, like we, I mentioned earlier about electricity assistance programs or energy assistance programs, and then how those are distributed across a region. 
And so there's so much uh, political factors at play that will in, uh, influence how people use their energy and how much they consume that I think it's just a really, <laughs> that's a really challenging question to answer, to be honest. All right, thanks. I, I think Farhana's um, screen is frozen. So um, I think we have two more questions um, from Meg and Scott. Um, and so Meg, go ahead. Scott, I think you are actually first if you want to go. I'm sorry I'm about that. Enrolled in the class, so I yeah, want to make sure you have time. Meg, you showed up first on my screen, uh, you're, you know, first in line. So I, I didn't realize. Scott, please go ahead. Okay, I just have a quick question. I was wondering, I see you have about four years of data. And I was wondering if any of those households for those four years had done something like put on residential solar or maybe like a weatherization program had happened or something. And if you saw the web, the inflection point changing for that household when they adopt maybe better insulation or, or solar and how that affects the data. So we do not, so there are, okay, you had multiple questions in there. So we don't have information on the insulation. Uh, we do have some information on solar adoption and heat pump adoption. And that's one of the things that we are planning on looking at moving forward. And uh, we also are concerned about like outages as well. And if you did not have a um, one of those two technologies before and you experienced an outage, how long did it take you to recover? And then following actually adopting those technologies. Now, if you experience an outage, how long will it take you to recover? And that can actually get to like household resilience, but also the impact of electrification on people's ability to recover from outages. So we have not done it yet. <laughs> That's a bit of the ongoing, ongoing work. Um, and then I'm trying to think if we had any other information that might pertain to this one. I think those are the two main technology adoptions though that we do have. And we actually don't know insulation of these homes specifically. We do have household age, and we can infer from that, you know, who is more likely to have uh, less insulation in the home, but we don't actually have information about if people have gone in and re-insulated their home, for example. Meg, go ahead. Cool, yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. I think um, this was a really brilliant way of accounting for the ways people are limiting themselves, which is obviously not captured in what they're spending. So I appreciate this kind of just approach. Um, I think two things that I was thinking about, one was just um, balancing the fact that everyone should be able to live at a comfortable temperature. And then also I see that some of the behaviors like opening windows at night instead of using air conditioning are more sustainable. And in some cases, the behaviors of the most affluent groups may be more unsustainable. So just kind of trying to balance where that threshold is. Um, and maybe it's best to not even try. But the other thing that I was thinking was that also, I think it could have interesting implications for the responsiveness to price signals. Um, so I know like people are wanting to use time of use to encourage people to limit their consumption during times when the energy is more carbon intensive here um, or are talking about that. So I think it's interesting to see how the highest income groups who are probably using the most energy are the ones who are not responsive to changes in electricity price. So uh, two things on that one. Uh, so first, for the time of use prices, I think that the biggest thing is to recognize who can and cannot shift their behavior. And that is going to be, you know, the biggest, I think, drawback of time of use pricing if it's implemented in low income communities that if they're already limiting their behavior to potentially unsafe levels, and now we are trying to get them to change it again. I mean, in the winter, that could mean we see more space heaters being used right, in more unsafe practices. In the summer, I mean, hopefully we see more fans and things, but it also could just mean that, you know, we're seeing more instances of, you know, heat risk. And that is something that is, is concerning. So then of course, with the time of use pricing to incentivize behavior changes, it's all about getting that price right. So there is a threshold where the price would be correct. It's just that when you're trying to spread that price equally across all income groups, you're most likely not gonna hit the highest ones. It could still be too high for the lowest ones, and really now you have the flaw of the averages where you hit the average one, but now the people at the extremes are, are the worst off. 
And so then going back to your first point about, you know, the highest income group having unsafe or not unsafe, but unsustainable um, behaviors. And that is one of the biggest limitations of this work using that highest income group to set it, set that baseline, because really what we want to do is set the baseline at the safe temperatures, right? So I started off this talk by talking about uh, people could potentially be putting themselves in harm's way if they let their house get way too hot, right? And, and they put themselves at risk of heat stroke or they're letting their house get too cold, meaning that they're at risk of hypothermia. Now we just do not have information about you know, the actual indoor temperature of the home. We don't have thermostat set points either. And so that actually could be a better baseline target. And that's going to require more data sharing about thermostat set points, right? Actual temperature in the home, um, another thing that we haven't included in this analysis at the moment is the urban heat islanding effect, where if you are living in a place with no shading in the summer, it's going to feel a lot hotter inside than it actually appears to the outside, um, especially with the concrete uh, absorbing and then releasing that. So there's a lot of factors here <laughs> trying to get at human behavior. And I do want to fully acknowledge those and the limitations of the work that we've done thus far. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Knock. You actually answered like two of my questions right there about the heat island effects and whether you that that was something you could account for among groups. Um, We're trying so to right now. Actually, we would like to, um, but so far the only data that we found for Chicago or for yes Chicago area is just are is it a heat island or not? And it's not actually about like over time what do the actual temperatures look like across those different heat islands which is really like the data that you would want in order to kind of get that temperature differential. Totally. Um, so interesting. So I, we are out of time here. I know that there were still a few questions, um, but hopefully Dr. Knott can stay for our, our smaller group discussion, um, which occurs after this in just a few students. Um, so with that, I'd like to close uh, today's uh, seminar and give a big thank you uh, to Dr. Knott for coming and speaking to us today. And Thank you all for coming. Of course. And Ali, maybe you can um, just remind people uh, how to meet up for the for the after discussion.